good day. So, today we will be uh, speaking about uh, fiber optic uh, components and fiber optic communication. Uh, as a matter of fact, this lecture and well, uh, as well as the next couple of lectures, we will concentrate on fiber optic communication. We have uh, looked at some of the physical uh, layer components of uh, fiber optic systems before. Uh, so, we will sort of quickly review that. So, some of the uh, stuff that we will be talking about today uh, is going to be common uh, and then from that point we will take off, take it up into WDM systems that means details of uh, how wavelength division multiplexing is done and how systems are uh, handled in the fiber optic domain. This fiber optic domain happens to be very crucial because uh, a lot of uh, um, traffic in terms of volume okay, may be as much as 40 to 50 percent actually follow uh, goes through the fiber and as days are going by and as uh, more and more demand for uh, bandwidth is coming up, fiber optics is becoming more and more important. So, we will be talking about fiber optic components today. Uh, so, in fiber optic components of course, the basic fiber uh, is there, we have already talked about it. So, we will talk a little bit more about this. Then we have light sources and receivers on the two end, because we know in that in fiber optic uh, cables, light is the carrier of information. Then we require these uh, different components like amplifiers, we need couplers, modulators, multiplexers and switches. So, we will look at uh, these components one by one and then we will start our discussion on wavelength division multiplexing. So, optical fiber as was mentioned earlier is very pure and very transparent silica glass used. Uh, so, at moderate dimension the light is restricted to the fiber because of total internal reflection. Uh, for ordinary light. This is a multimode fiber. Okay. MMF is used in LANs for low speed or short distances. So, MMF may be used in LANs, uh, th there is another kind of fiber, the, but the multimode fiber happens to be the cheaper variety uh, and this is used in LANs, but this is good only for uh, low speed. Well, when I say low speed, I mean comparatively low speed. Okay. Uh, for this uh, say 100 Mbps or 155 Mbps may be a low speed. Uh, and by short distances may be uh, a couple of kilometers at the maximum uh, that is a short distance. Okay. Uh, at still smaller dimension that means when the dimension of the fiber uh, that means that, that that part of the fiber um, which actually carries the signal. Um, if you remember our discussion uh, about the when we were discussing fibers in physical layer, we had shown some uh, diagrams regarding the cross section of a fiber. So, at the very core there is a very thin uh, uh, strand of fiber uh, glass fiber which actually carries the signal. This is surrounded by a uh, cladding which is also made of glass. So, actually you will not be able to see the actual part of the fiber which is carrying the signal. The surrounding is also made of uh, glass and then that is again coated uh, or uh, covered etcetera by outer uh, <coughs> uh, protection. So, if that strand happens to be even smaller say in the 8 to 10 nanometer range, then it acts like a waveguide and a single mode of uh, operation. So, we will not go into the details of electromagnetics and waveguide propagation of uh, optics to this uh, um, fiber, but anyway since a single mode of propagation uh, it uh, su it supports it is called a single mode fiber. SMF is used for higher speed. So, all these speeds of uh, 2.5 gigabits per second or 10 gigabits per second etcetera they are possible on single mode fiber and it also uh, goes over longer distances okay. and uh, nowadays we have fibers which uh, span across uh, oceans. Okay. So, we have fibers from one continent to another which is really a marvel of engineering and technology. Uh, so, um, so, so, these fibers are all actually single mode fibers. Um, there are a few transmission windows uh, like 13, 10 and 15, 50 uh, nanometer S and C band etcetera. So, 1550 uh, nanometer uh, window is preferred for long haul applications, 
because it has less attenuation, wider window and we can get very easily get uh, good optical amplifiers in this range. So, this is the diagram we have seen this before. So, you will see that around the 1550 nanometer range um, here. Uh, so, we have uh, the some kind of uh, low attenuation <coughs> similarly 1310 uh, <coughs> nanometer that is another window, but this window is quite wide although it may not look very wide in this um, diagram but uh, in actual practice this is quite uh, wide. Okay. Um, so, this is the so we get a wider window and we get good optical amplifiers. We will come back to this point when we discuss optical amplifiers. Now, why do we require uh, amplifiers because there are losses in fiber. Losses in fiber may be due to various reasons. One of course, the main thing is absorption that is what we showed uh, in the previous diagram that it loses uh, energy to the atoms. So, atoms absorb some of the photons. So, we get uh, lower uh, magnitude or lower strength of the um, light signal as we go to longer and longer distances. Then there is scattering of the photons by, uh, uh, by the medium. So, there is Rayleigh scattering due to slight changes in the refractive index of glass. Then there is mice scattering due to imperfection of the cylindrical structure. It is uh, made uh, due to, uh, to exact spe I mean quite uh, rigorous specifications, but it is never exact in the engineering world it can never be exact. So, we get all these different types of scattering absorption etcetera leading to losses in fiber. So, uh, and apart from this uh, just uh, lowering of the signal strength the one problem is that the losses are non-uniform for different uh, wavelengths. Okay. That means, that the uh, loss may be more for one particular frequency and loss may be less for another particular another frequency. The trouble is when you take a waveform especially a digital waveform which is a square waveform and if you analyze it you will get a lot of spectral component if you do a Fourier transformation on that. So, you will get all the different harmonics or components of that particular um, uh, wave shape. Okay. Uh, and uh, the if the uh, and these for that for that perfect square shape uh, to come up these different harmonics have to be at uh, specific strength compared to each other. Now, due to differential losses at different frequencies what would happen is that some of the harmonic. So, their balance would get disturbed what you will see actually is that that your pulse shape has changed. Okay. So, um, this is the what is known as chromatic dispersion chromatic because it depends on the wavelength or frequency or wavelength. So, that is why uh, the or the color of the light so that is why it is called chromatic. So, different spectral components of a pulse travel at different velocities this is another problem. Uh, and uh, so, also called group velocity dispersion. So, we get a some kind of a group velocity for all these different components uh, and uh, this leads to some kind of uh, dispersion. So, this is an example of a um, uh, chromatic pulse we need not go into the details of this, but we have uh, this is the input pulse uh, uh, whereas, in the output you get a much more flattened shape. Uh, because these different components have been attenuated differently uh, as it uh, went along the fiber. For compensating these dispersions, so nowadays some uh, special types of fibers, you know, lots of special types of fibers have ca come up. Uh, we cannot go into the details of this. One is the reduced dispersion fibers dispersion shifted fibers. By dispersion shifted we mean that uh, the natural uh, uh, dispersion that is sort of counteracted non-zero dispersion shifted fiber, fiber. Anyway, the point is compared to uh, normal SMF which is there in most of the places say more than 95 percent of the deployed plant uh, the, um, the dispersion and dispersion is measured in picosecond per nanometer kilometer. So, dispersion is much lower. Okay. And for some uh, some of the interesting area or the window 
uh, what we get is that uh, we get almost the zero dispersion uh, for uh, these fibers. So, we, uh, get, we can get very special fibers these days which may be utilized for very long haul application where dispersion becomes a problem. By the way for short haul applications when you are travel that this is really going through a few kilometers then the dispersion is not uh, much of a problem and we need not bother about this uh, dispersion shifted characteristic of the fiber because uh, an ordinary fiber whatever dispersion it gives in that small uh, uh, distance it will not uh, matter very appreciably. We have a bandwidth span uh, product that means uh, how much bandwidth uh, for what kind of distance. Okay. This is very common in almost all kinds of transmission line. Okay. Uh, so, a transmission line which operates at a particular speed uh, quite well for uh, some distance uh, will not operate that well if you either uh, increase the uh, uh, rate at which you are pumping in data that means if you increase the frequency or if you keep the data rate constant and if you increase the length uh, then that would also uh, not uh, work very well. So, uh, for any kind of medium uh, we get a bandwidth distance product uh, which tend to be more or less uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, constant. So, uh, a fiber which is good for maybe at a certain particular speed uh, for let us say 2 kilometers uh, may be just uh, good enough for 1 kilometer when you double the data rate. All right. So, for older kind of SMF which uh, at uh, 13 10 nanometer, so we get a speed I mean these are some typical figures, okay. they are not exact figures. So, these are some typical uh, figures to get some idea. So, we can operate it at 2.5 gigabits per second for uh, 6, 640 kilometers without amplification or 10 gigabits per second for let us say 100 uh, kilometers. Recent SMF can take 2.5 gigabits for 4400 kilometers okay, which spans from one continent to another or 10 gigabits per second for 500 kilometers. Of course, you should multiply these figures for uh, DWDM and we will talk about WDM presently where it gives you a, a large number of channels maybe 40 channels. So, you can see that you can realize really tremendous data rate a very very high data rate uh, using this uh, fiber optic uh, communication and that is the major um, advantage of fiber. There are of course, other advantages like uh, you have uh, I mean you do not have uh, you are not susceptible to electromagnetic radiation that is one good thing because nowadays with so many gadgets all around and so many things moving around we get all kinds of a very noisy electromagnetic uh, ambience we have, uh, but uh, I mean fiber is immune to all that. So, those are all good points of fiber. Next from fiber we come to light source that is the uh, LED. Light sources of course, are two types depending on whether we are using multi mode fibers or single mode fibers usually we would use uh, uh, ordinary light in a multi mode fiber and the source of the ordinary light would be LED. One good thing about LED is of course, that it is very cheap. So, uh, uh, so good thing about multi mode fiber is that it is cheap only thing is that it will not scale up very well uh, with that uh, bandwidth uh, distance product. So, it is a an LED is just a forward biased p n junction what happens is that recombination of injected minority carriers by spontaneous emission produces light and it has a broad spectrum up to gain bandwidth of the medium. So, that is an LED. It is usually with a, of a low power, okay. power you remember is just that for power you have to divide it by time. So, although you might get a continuous source of light, but it will be comparatively low power like 20 dBm low internal modulation rate. So, you can modulate it if you internally modulate it you can modulate it at best at hundreds of megabits per second which of course, for some applications it may be more than enough speed, uh, but then again if you are talking about the um, core of uh, wide area networks then it may not um, then it may be, it is a very low speed. So, obviously, in a core of a net wide area network we will not be using multi mode fibers or LEDs. 
LED <coughs> slicing that is LED plus a filter it gives some power loss we need not bother about it at the moment. The other kind of light source which is very important are the lasers. Okay. Of course, we use semiconductor lasers here um, almost always. So, it uh, gives very high uh, I mean much higher power, power output. So, the this thing dura for a short duration of time we get quite intense uh, pulses of light. So, that is very good high uh, power output. It has got a sharp spectrum that is, is coherent. That means, it is not uh, over a wide uh, range of uh, spectrum. So, it is a very sharp spectrum that is the property of a laser. Okay. Uh, so, uh, that uh, reduces the chromatic dispersion. Uh, now, inter it can be uh, uh, modulated either internally or externally. So, that is also a good point. So, it is uh, uh, good for longer distances and uh, larger bit rates compared to MMF. Um, uh, MLM we need not bother. Then we have another special kind of uh, devices giving us uh, tunable uh, lasers. Okay. Tunable lasers means it is a laser, but it is frequency that is the color of the light uh, we can change it over a certain range. And as we will see later that tunable lasers uh, may be quite important. Uh, in some cases we will see that. Now, uh, what kind of time do we require for this tuning? Well, it is fairly rapid in the sense that it is uh, in the less than milliseconds range. So, it is of the order of uh, milliseconds. So, in the order of millisecond we can change the uh, frequency uh, emitted by the uh, um, by that lasing system. It is wide and continuous range of over 100 nanometer it is a long lifeline and stable over lifetime and it is easily controllable and uh, manufacturable. So, these are the good points about uh, the tunable laser. The methods could be electro optical changing the refractive index by injecting current or applying an electric field. Uh, so, that is one way it could be temperature tuning although this is not very well preferred. Uh, so, the first of all its range is narrow and then it may degrade lifetime of a laser because if you want to do it through uh, temperature or mechanical tuning uh, using MEMS. Uh, <coughs> this is a compact, but one problem of this tunable laser is that it is costly all right. It is quite costly and uh, that is why this is not very common. It is costly and uh, maybe it is slightly more uh, complex to manage. So, that is why it is not very common, but in some instances it gives some advantages. We will mention this point later on when we discuss WDM. <laughs> then we come to receivers. Receivers are of course, that when a light pulse is coming, we have to detect that something has come, whether a pulse has come or whether a pulse has not come, whether it is a 1 or a 0. So, if a photon comes, so that will get into a sort of um, push up an electron to the conduction band. So, that is a standard photo, dete uh, photo detector which you must have studied in school. Uh, so, uh, if it is uh, sort of higher than this, um, this gap, uh, this energy gap, then uh, we get the electron in the conduction band which will uh, naturally which will show up uh, by conducting. So, that is an easiest thing. Now, if you have long haul fiber as I was mentioning that nowadays we have fibers running for thousands of kilometers. So, if you have such long haul fiber uh, what would happen is that naturally after some distance um, what you will have to do is that uh, your signal will become weak. So, you will have to amplify this previously this distance would be something of the order of maybe 4 or 5 kilometers. Okay. Nowadays 25 kilometers is very common you can go hundreds or in with special things you can go even up to uh, many hundreds of kilometers uh, you can go without amplification, but whatever it is after some distance you will if the because of this loss absorption and uh, dispersion etcetera etcetera you will have to uh, amplify the signal. So, optical signals traveling for long distances through fiber needs to be strengthened. This may be done through OLT um, that was the older technology. In OLT what was done is that the optical signal was converted back to the electronic domain. Uh, so, so, and then you amplify the signal and then push it back to the optical domain. 
uh, this obviously has a uh, quite a number of disadvantages, main disadvantage being cost and uh, speed. That means, its cost is higher and speed is lower. This has some advantages also, I will mention that later. This may be done in the optical domain. If we the, the idea was that if it could be done in the optical domain through RBM doped fiber amplifiers, there are other kinds of dopants we will mention, we will see that. So, this is the uh, scenario we have this uh, light propagating and as it propagates with distance the, sig uh, the signal level comes down. When it comes down to the minimum operating level at that point we have to have an amplifier which will amplify the signal back and then again after some time it will sort of decay and then again we amplify. So, these are some kind of repeaters. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, uh, we come to one point that simple amplification is not always enough. Sometimes we require regeneration and regenerator these are the th so called 3 R reamplify, reshape and retime. Okay. Now, so far as absorption is concerned uh, what um, if you simply amplify the that means increase the strength of the signal that is uh, good enough all right. So, uh, so the absorption loss or the uh, loss of strength can be handled that way. But uh, due to chromatic when you are talking about long very long distances due to chromatic dispersion etcetera your uh, wave shape will become distorted as we have seen. So, and, uh, and for, for a very long distance then on the, on the other side there will be a tremendous amount of error. So, that may not be acceptable. So, you have to get the wave back into shape. Okay. Now, there are some special kinds of fibers uh, to try to do it in the optical uh, domain, uh, but uh, more commonly deployed as they are deployed today is that to bring them to the electronic domain and then give them the right nice square shape once again. So, that is the second R. And the third R is the timing. Okay, so that means how do you keep all the clocks uh, synchronized? Because after all, um, I mean maybe some uh, TDM signal, etc., is traveling. So uh, you have to have uh, very strict uh, control over the time. So this uh, reamplify, reshape, and retime. This is the three R kind of regeneration. Sometimes we may have the only two R. Okay, or simply one R, which is simply reamplify, which can be done simply with a uh, EDFA, that is the um, RBM doped fiber amplifier. So at certain distances, we simply uh, reamplify this. Um, so 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 that is uh, this is the uh, thing. <coughs> if we want to do some reshaping, suppose this is the input shape which has come. Uh, there are uh, this is uh, this goes to the OE tra um, transformation that means from the optical domain we come to the electronic domain we amplify this shape this properly and then again push it back by uh, from the electronic domain to the optical domain. So, we get again nicely shaped pulse at the output which have been strengthened as well as uh, reshaped all right. Um, as I was saying that the problem uh, of this is that uh, naturally we can do this uh, reshaping as well as amplification at the same time, but uh, one problem uh, that we face in this case is that uh, the cost is high okay, because the cost is high that is one problem. And the other problem is that electro optics inherently can operate at a very high speed, uh, but the um, for the we can uh, get a fairly high speed electronics also, uh, but it becomes more and more difficult in the electronic domain as the speed becomes higher and higher. And uh, when that happens, uh, um, so we would like to do it in the optical domain if we could and there are a number of schemes today for handling this in the optical domain. Um, um, for example, we can uh, have some very specially shaped um, Mm, uh, optical waves whose shape will not change over uh, distance. So, they are called solitons. So, they are uh, uh, sort of uh, done in um, uh, the different of spectral components are mixed in such a manner. So, that the after dispersion uh, they are relative this thing will sort of cancel out each other. Okay. Similarly, there are fibers uh, which uh, da, uh, gives the dispersion in the opposite uh, direction to the standard fiber, 
so that it can bring we can bring it back to shape. So, these are all attempts to uh, handle this reshaping in the optical domain, but as I said that the most widely deployed uh, system as of today is to take it to the electronic domain and do it there. Regenerators uh, are specific to bit rate, so that is another problem with the electronic domain that is that it is a it is an opaque unit that means it is a specific to bit rate and modulation format that is used. Whereas, op, um, optical amplifiers in the optical domain whatever is coming is being amplified, so it is transparent to uh, what is the bit rate, what is the modulation format, what is the protocol it is transparent to all that, so whatever is coming it is simply amplifying. So, that is good thing about uh, op, um, optical amplifiers, a system with optical amplifiers can be more easily upgraded to higher bit rate without replacing the amplifiers. Whereas, uh, if you are if you are going, uh, going to use the same infrastructure for a higher bit rate as service providers often want to do, uh, in that case uh, if you are uh, taking it to the electronic domain you will have to replace all of them. Optical amplifiers have large gain bandwidth, so they, they are also um, key enabler of uh, dense wavelength division multiplexing uh, which we will discuss. One of the standard kind of uh, fiber amplifiers which is very widely deployed is this RBM doped for fiber amplification, we have talked about this earlier. RBM has a large number of excited states and for, from some of the excited states it gives out this 1550 nanometer light exactly the wavelength used in the third window. A few meters of optical fiber doped with few parts per million of RBM is pumped with 1480 or 980 nanometer laser to give amplification. So, we have uh, seen this before. So, EDFAs amplify all lambdas in the 1550 window simultaneously. So, key performance parameters include saturation output power, noise figure gain flatness uh, or pass band etcetera. So, this is the as I said that uh, we have the input signal coming through the regular fiber and this is the part which is RBM doped uh, and you pump some laser. So, these are sort of combined using some kind of a coupler here, we will talk about coupler later on and what happens is that this uh, are because of this pumping laser the RBM <coughs> ions become excited and when the incoming signal uh, hits these, so they fall back uh, to the ground state and may be uh, emitting more photons, so the signal is amplified. There is another kind of amplifier called Raman amplifier which where you use longer uh, lengths of fiber, this has other advantages, so I am not going into, so it uses basically Raman scattering, so we will not go into the <coughs> sorry details of this. Once again what we have is that we pump it through some kind of pump and signal, this pump may be in the same direction as the signal is going or it may be counter pumped in the other direction and the whole point is that this um, pump um, keeps the uh, atoms uh, excited and uh, so because of due to Raman scattering, uh, so more and more photons come out, so we get an amplified signal finally. We have other kinds of dopants also, RBM doped for the 1550 nanometer range, Presidonium doped fluoride fiber, PDFFA for the 1310 nanometer, Thorium doped for the 1350 to 1450 nanometer, Thulium doped, well this is um, uh, somewhat more um, academic because Thulium etcetera this is a rare earth uh, material, so it is not very easily available. Uh, and uh, even if it is available it is quite costly, anyway this is in the 1450 to 1530 nanometer range. Tellurium RBM doped uh, fibers of this 1530 to uh, 1600 nanometer range. Raman amplifiers address an extended spectrum using standard single mode uh, fiber, so that is a good thing about Raman amplifier. So, EDFA is popular in the C band, Ramon proposed for S band, gain shifted EDFA for L band etcetera, we need not bother, we can just have a look at this, different depending on the wavelengths, different kinds of dopants and different kinds of fiber amplifier becomes more uh, relevant like EDFA for this range from this 1550 etcetera, <coughs> TDFA, PDFA, Raman amplification for this entire range uh, etcetera. 
Now, we talk about some more uh, uh, components uh, and the first component we talk about is an uh, sort of passive device called a coupler. Okay. So, optical coupler, so it combines and splits signals, wavelength independent or selective that means the coupler can be wavelength independent as well as wavelength selective, fabricated using waveguides in integrated optics. Uh, so, light couples from one waveguide to a closely placed waveguide because the propagation mode overlaps the two waveguides. So, this is here is the uh, picture. So, you have an input uh, waveguide coming and an input another input two comes it may come and there are two outputs. So, what uh, might happen is that um, the I mean it may be used as a coupler that means two signals joining together uh, like we wanted to do when we tried to uh, put in a pump. Uh, in the EDFA amplifier or it may be used for splitting that means, signal is coming from one and it is getting split into two directions. So, various ways this can be uh, used. So, if alpha is the coupling ratio power output one is alpha times power of input one whereas, power of output two is one minus alpha times power of input one. So, you see together there so the input power is split into two parts naturally if you have uh, if you if you want to have say alpha equal to half these are the so called 3 dB couplers. So, they put half the power in input 1 and half the power in uh, uh, sorry half the power in output 1 and half the power in output 2. So, if you want to broadcast the same uh, signal to two different destinations uh, you can use a, a 3 dB coupler all right. As I said, that light couples from one waveguide to a closely placed waveguide. Identical waveguides uh, imply complete coupling and back periodically. So, this is the couple mode theory. There is, of course, you have to follow the conservation of energy constraints. So, you cannot get more, since this is a passive device, you cannot get more uh, out of it than what you put in. Actually, you get less. So, possible that electric fields at two outputs have same magnitude, so that they are exactly the same but will be 90 degrees out of phase and lossless combining is uh, not possible. So, nothing is really 100 percent efficient. Passive star is a sort of uh, generalization of this, it is a broadcast device, broadcast device to more than one um, more, more than one uh, uh, recipient divides receive signal to all output ports at original wavelength. Of course, if you divide the same signal into so many uh, different signals, the received strength of signal would be proportionally less. So, that you will have to handle by either amplification or some other this thing or maybe weak signal is good enough for your application etcetera it depends. So, n into n passive stars can route n simultaneous communications through. So, this is an example of an 8 port splitter. So, whatever signal is coming it is getting divided into 2 and then again divided into 2 each of them. So, we get 8 signals over here. So, we can get this 8. Uh, so, we can use actually some 3 dB couplers to uh, form this 8 port splitter from uh, Y couplers. This is another example of an 8 into 8 star coupler. Okay. So, what would happen is that there are 8 <coughs> lines any of these might communicate uh, something which will be broadcast to all the other seven um, all the other seven ports. Okay. So, such things are used for uh, broadcasting. Now, we come to optical modulation that means, how you will modulate it of course, I mean the simple modulation scheme. Uh, since we are talking only about digital systems as on off keying that means, either it is on or off either it is 1 or 0. There are two types of modulation techniques namely direct modulation versus external modulation. So, uh, in modulation the extinction ratio that means, ratio of output power for bt equal to 1 to output power for bt equal to 0 uh, this is uh, very important we want this um, to be as high as possible. Some lasers cannot be directly modulated that is one problem and direct modulation another problem is that direct modulation that means, you are modulating at the source modulating at the same place from where that uh, light source is there where the light is being generated 
uh, whatever diode or whatever you are using for generating it, we want to modulate it the, uh, through that only. So, that is called direct modulation. Whereas, indirect in indirect modulation what we will do is that there is a continuous source of light and just as the light comes out we will modulate it that means, we will put it on or off by making it go through something. So, that is the external modulation. So, solution is external naturally since direct modulation has especially that problem about uh, that chirp etcetera. So, we external modulation for higher speeds longer distance dispersion limited regimes etcetera. So, we prefer external modulations light. So, light source is continuously operated external modulation turns light signal on or off. So, this is the optical modulation. They can be integrated in the same package as the laser. Okay. So, as I said that um, the laser source is there and that modulator is there it is external, but they can be packaged uh, all very together as we will see. So, electro absorption or EA modulator is one important uh, kind of modulator. It applies an electric field it shrinks the band gap and protons are absorbed. So, this is a picture. So, this is the continuous uh, source of uh, this light which is being uh, modulated that means, put on and off depending on whether you want to transmit 1 or a 0. The next set of components are these multiplexers, filters, gratings we have talked just a little bit about it. If you uh, look at this uh, uh, wavelength, so these are all wavelength selective devices multiplexers, filters, gratings these are wavelength selective uh, devices. In a wavelength filter what we want is that suppose a lambda 1, lambda 2 etcetera so many are coming I want only lambda 1 out okay. lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4 etcetera are absorbed or something. Whereas, if you if you are a multiplexer I want these different lambdas are coming in different uh, lines I want them all to be mixed together and uh, use the same uh, line. Okay. So, that is a wavelength multiplexer. So, application could be wave particular wavelength or a particular wave band selection. A uh, wave band is nothing but uh, some contiguous uh, operating wavelengths uh, which are all uh, side by side. Okay. If you remember <coughs> that in the operating window whatever be that uh, 1550 or whatever be the window that you are using there you can have a number of lambdas all side by side there is a guard band between each of these operating lambdas. So, guard band and that is given by the ITUT has specified how much guard band etcetera you will have to have, but so you can have a large number of lambdas all grouped together in that same window. Now, a band out of that that means a bunch of frequencies out of that you can sort of select instead of just selecting only one frequency so, that is a wavelength band selection static wavelength cross connects or uh, and OADMs. The OADMs is optical add drop multiplexers. We have come across this term of add drop multiplexers in the context of um, your sonnet, but in the optical domain we require optical add drop multiplexers. We will come to that. Equalization of gain, so that is another application, filtering of noise, ideas used in laser operation and dispersion compensation modules etcetera. These are the different applications. One of the standard uh, wavelength selective uh, component is the arrayed waveline waveguide grating. We have seen this before. So, it is a, these are curved sections of silica acting as waveguides. Each waveguide slightly different in length. Incoming signal is split. Uh, so, this uh, slightly different in length is running uh, is like a running track bend. Uh, running track, you know that the outer track. Uh, in any say athletic event like a, a long say 800 meter race or something the outer track is really longer than the uh, inner track. So, that is why the athletes are given a proper handicap because we wa there we want we want to make all the distances the same. Here we deliberately want the distances to be different. Uh, so, if they are different they are going to uh, sort of uh, arrive uh, somewhat out of phase at the output. So, incoming signal is split every wavelength then travels down each waveguide. Time delayed signals recombine to give each wavelength its own waveguide can be reversed to act as a multiplexer rather than a demultiplexer. 
usable in optical integrated uh, circuits easily combined with other functions. So, this is the picture we had seen earlier. So, if your if your light is going in uh, this direction what you are doing is that you are demultiplexing that means, uh, one bunch of frequencies are coming we want all these different colors to get separated out. So, that is a demultiplexing action going on. If the uh, different wavelengths or different colors of lights are coming in the other direction, so it is just the exact opposite thing will happen and we will get a multiplexer. So, that is this AWG acting either as a multiplexer or demultiplexer depending on how you operate it. Now, we come to optical switches, we have seen uh, electrical switches, now we talk a little bit about optical switches. Now, what is optical switching? You remember that uh, electrical what was electrical switching after all? In electrical switching what we uh, did was um, there are some uh, one input line maybe is coming in line i and I want to get that signal out through line j. So, we want to operate the switch if you remember your cross bar switches or something that the i th line and j th lines with the help of a switch we want to connect them. So, the basic idea was the i th line the signal coming down from the i th line has to go out of the j th uh, output line. Okay. So, that was a that was a simple switching element here also it is the same thing that some wavelength is coming through some fiber that is one input port we want to get it out of uh, may be another fiber. Uh, okay. So, for the time being uh, let us say that we do not have any wavelength conversion kind of thing for the same wavelength. So, we want to push it to another fiber. So, that is my switching at the optical plane. So, redirecting light from one optical fiber to another without electrical conversion. So, we are sort of always uh, sort of harping on this without electrical conversion for the same reason that we can then can operate it at a much higher ray, higher speed. Secondly, maybe it may be cheaper also at high speeds it will be cheaper and then uh, if we, when we upgrade eventually this is going to be transparent this does not uh, depend on the underlying whatever uh, uh, protocol etcetera is being used at the higher layer. So, uh, that is all the advantages of doing it at the optical plane. Now, most advanced optical switching technology is MEMS that is tiny movable mirrors. So, this is a crossbar switch 4 into 4 switch and this picture also we have seen that is MEMS optical cross connect. So, you see that these are all tiny mirrors what I can do is that some signal which is just follow the red line which is coming it is we are using these two mirrors to push it to the uh, uh, line number uh, 3 over here from line number 1 to line number 3. So, this way by uh, just adjusting the angles of the mirrors which we can do through this MEMS technology we can uh, have an uh, I mean so it is a very simple and elegant kind of switch. Uh, so, it is just that light goes and bumps off the couple of mirrors and goes out the other fiber. So, whatever a signal it is carrying what protocol it is carrying it is immaterial similarly what is the data rate also it that is also immaterial. Okay. So, this is a MEMS optical cross connect. <coughs> now, all this technology um, sort of enables uh, what is known as a uh, WDM technology which is a wavelength division multiplexing. As I was as I mentioned when we were discussing uh, multiplexing is that wavelength division multiplexing is nothing but frequency division multiplexing. That means, you want your different channels to come at different frequencies um, just it is just that in the optical domain we call it wavelength division multiplexing <coughs> different wavelengths and different lambdas getting together and light with different wavelengths can very well mix together and go to the other end that is we have seen. Uh, for example, sunlight it is uh, got all that frequency it is all mixed up to uh, I mean sort of appear as white light to us. If you send it through a prism all these different frequencies will uh, split up. So, we get some kind of a demultiplexing action. So, we want to use this uh, property for wavelength division multiplexing for achieving very high uh, data rates all right and there are uh, two kinds of wavelength division multiplexing or WDM that people talk about. Uh, mostly in the backbone 
people use DWDM. By DWDM, we mean that dense wavelength division multiplexing. By dense means that means we put a lot of channels, lot of lambdas side by side. Uh, so, we get a lot of channels. Of course, DWDM uh, is uh, would not usually be deployed in a LAN because DWDM is costly, but then at the backbone where you are talking about very high speed uh, that cost is uh, effective. Whereas, another kind of uh, wavelength division multiplexing is coming into uh, LANs uh, just now which is called CWDM or coarse wavelength division multiplexing there the um, wavelengths are not so closely packed they are sort of more sparsely uh, placed uh, which is a good thing because then uh, the stability of these lasers uh, the sources detectors etc they are less of an issue so cwdm tends to be cheaper uh, than uh, dwdm and we use uh, cwdm is coming into use these days so, we will start our discussion on wavelength division multiplexing today uh, in this lecture and then we will continue uh, with the um, I mean in the next, next lecture about the details of wavelength division multiplexing. So, as I said WDM increases the capacity of optical fibers different wavelength lasers each transmit at the same time uh, down the same fiber multiplexing is combining wavelengths demultiplexing is splitting of wavelengths. Usually, the number of wavelengths is in the power of 2, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, etcetera. I um, mean, things like 32, 64, etcetera are be, uh, sort of uh, 16, 32, 64 are being are deployed now. People are talking about hundreds of wavelengths or maybe even thousands. Wavelengths separated by multiples of 0 0.8 nanometer guard band. I mentioned this, which is really comes equivalent to 100 gigahertz. So, there is a 100 gigahertz separation between two lambdas that is the um, minimum separation which is um, sort of uh, which is uh, I mean which is mandated by this ITU standard. Coarse WDM has widely separated wavelengths so that uh, the uh, things I mean the components can be a little less sophisticated and much more uh, I mean much cheaper. <coughs> this is a WDM system different lasers of different lights coming together through the multiplexer flowing down the same fiber at the same time being demultiplexed on the other line. So, the multiplexer demultiplexer as we have seen could be an AWG um, or, um, and, or uh, there are some others also. In point to point WDM system that means one point is connected to another point through multiple uh, wavelengths. Okay. Mm. WDM is most cost effective technology in point to point technology that is uh, uh, where the distance is about greater than 50 kilometers. In shorter distances multi fiber is cheaper because DWDM naturally or uh, your end equipments tend to become quite costly. So, if you just have some extra strands of fiber then that may be a cheaper option. Wavelength add drop multiplexer that is one thing we require that means we want to add on to a stream of uh, WDM uh, I mean that is going through some fiber we want to add on some uh, extra wavelengths on the way or we want to take just one wavelength out and let the others pass through. So, that is a wavelength add drop multiplexing needed for routing and wavelength assignment perform the same function as the electronic counterpart at the level of wavelength. So, electronic counterpart we have come across this the ADMs in sonnet. So, the same thing is happened uh, in the optical domain <coughs> sorry. One problem is that the granularity is high because of inherent capacity of wavelength. So, even if you take the point is that even if you take out one single wavelength out of a whole bunch of wavelength that one single wavelength can carry a large amount of tra traffic. So, something like let us say 2.5 gigabits per second. So, that is a high amount of traffic. So, if there are low small amounts of traffic which you want to add or drop then this is not a very effective technology. WADM has multiplexers and a set of 2 into 2 switches, uh, one for each wavelength. They are managed electronically, that means these uh, switches, etcetera, they are programmed uh, electronically. 
con control which incoming length flow through and which is uh, dropped. Uh, sorry for this. So, uh, fiber and wavelength cross connect. So, that is another important component of uh, this WDM. This is needed in real networks. Point to point uh, connection does not need a passive star or a passive router. Uh, <coughs> active switch, but in WDM we may require all this for an entire communication network. So, we have discussed this. A passive router can route separately each wavelength, no wavelength conversion. Naturally, it is a passive element, so it cannot do any wavelength conversion. Allows wavelength reuse, same wavelength can carry multiple connections through the uh, router. Okay. For example, uh, say uh, the same wavelength coming from uh, fiber 1 going out through fiber 3 and uh, the same wavelength being coming in from uh, fiber 2 and going out through fiber 4 uh, that is perfectly possible. So, if enough wavelengths n into n router can route n square simultaneous connection if wavelengths are there. <coughs> if um, so, there are some routing issues, we will talk about the routing issues in the next lecture. And finally, we have may have some active switch which has all the features that a passive router has. The difference is active routing matrix, it has some functionality and has to be powered. Okay. So, uh, so have to be powered is of course, uh, an issue sometimes when you are talking about very long haul. So, uh, with this we uh, uh, conclude our initial uh, portion of our uh, discussion and in the next lecture we are going to discuss uh, the details of that uh, WDM that means how uh, different wavelengths they are uh, routed uh, through the network and how we can get an entire network out of it. Thank you. Good day. So, in this lecture, we are going to continue our discussion on wavelength division multiplexing. Specifically, we are going to talk about uh, routing and wavelength assignment. Routing and wavelength assignment to what? Well, routing and wavelength assignment means that we have some stream of uh, packets or whatever data or whatever communication is going on from one source to one destination. Now, these sources and destination first of all one thing is of course, a point to point connection if there is a point to point connection they directly send through the fiber that is <coughs> simple, but in general they will not be directly connected they will go through a network that they will go through some intermediate nodes to reach the uh, destination. So, this for this stream we have to route this that is one problem and the other thing is that may be there all the stream writes on some particular wavelength at the time uh, for the time being let us assume that it is continues on the same wavelength. Same wavelength. Uh, so, uh, we have to assign one wavelength to it. So, we have this problem of routing and wavelength assignment in WDM all optical networks. Okay. Of course, we can do routing etcetera very easily in the electronic domain that is known. Uh, and a routing in the electronic domain, how it is done, etcetera, we are not discussed is as yet. We will discuss it later on in the in this series of lectures. Uh, but uh, routing, uh, I mean, we are talking about a simple kind of routing problem here. So we will talk about routing and wavelength assignment. So this is an example of a light path establishment. Suppose you have this A, B, C, D, E these are connected. So, in the first part uh, left half of the figure what we have is the physical connections from A to B there is a connection, B to D there is a connection and so on. In this one uh, I show some uh, uh, something that means some RWA that means routing and wavelength assignment has already been done uh, and some of the wavelengths on some of the links have been used. So, here only two wavelengths are used. Let us say A to B they are not connected uh, say A to C, A to C a light path has been established via B. So, 
and at B there will be a switch which will switch uh, the but this uh, suppose this uh, dashed line is the lambda 1. Uh, so, the lambda 1 coming through this fiber from A to B that is switched to lambda 1 um, in using the same wavelength to the fi outgoing fiber from B to C. So, we have a light path established between B to C. Similarly, C to D there is a light path, B to D there is a light path, D to E there is a light path, A to F there is a light path, D to F there is a light path and so on using the same lambda 1. Then I want to connect E to C. Now, I cannot go from E to C after say la lambda 1 has been um, uh, sort of assigned. I cannot go but from E by lambda 1 to anywhere because all the outgoing fibers the lambda 1s have been used up this side for A, this side for B and this side for F. <coughs> Sorry. So, in order to connect from E to C I use another wavelength say lambda 2 which connects me via D. So, in the D the cross connect will connect this particular lambda from this fiber to this fiber. So, we will get a direct uh, light path from E to C. Similarly, we will get a light path from B to F using uh, lambda 2, A to D using lambda 2 and this way uh, they are all uh, connected. So, a burst has a long and variable length payload if it is long, so low amortized overhead and no fragmentation. A control packet is sent out of band that means using some other lambda, lambda control and reserves bandwidth that is lambda data it reserves a particular bandwidth along a particular path and configures the switches. So, uh, it is like uh, setting up a temporary light path from the source to the destination. A burst is sent after an offset time it arrives at a switch after it has been configured. So, no buffering is needed. So, our original problem is of not having optical buffers or buffers in the optical domain that is avoided in this fashion. So, what will happen is that this will now moving towards the other end uh, to the next node and here this will again uh, do some uh, do the go through the o, o to E and then do the switch um, uh, configuration and then again E to O and go to the next hop and this delay etcetera is calculated in such a fashion that when the burst arrives what happens is that we when the bus arrives at the intermediate node the switch fabric is already configured. So, you do not have to store it you simply it simply passes through in the optical domain. So, that is nice. So, offset of course, now is T minus delta because it spent delta amount of time over here. So, without any delay the bus goes through the optical switch fabric. So, depending on how many intervening nodes are there you have to have this original T. So, that finally, when this T is exhausted or offset is exhausted, but you have also reached your uh, destination.